Hello, everybody. In this video lecture, we will talk about cellular level of organization, the cellular transport. As always, I will use PowerPoint to help myself. Um, this is a PowerPoint that I'm using. Um, cellular level of organization cell transport. So let's go ahead and begin. I'm going to pick up my pointer. Okay. So plasma membranes are selectively permeable. That means that some molecules can move through and others can't. So if you look over here, you can see the uh, cell membrane, right, bilipid, phospholipid, sorry, bilayer, phospholipid bilayer. And these substances that are small and they don't have any charge, so small uncharged molecules, such as water, ammonia, carbon dioxide, oxygen, uh, they just move through the membrane. Uh, some lipid-soluble substances also can move through, but most of the molecules, they are water-soluble, soluble, and they cannot pass directly through. Ions cannot do it either. That's why we call it selectively permeable. Now, when molecule move across a cell membrane, this is called transport. There is two types of transport, passive and active transport. Passive transport does not use energy of ATP and substances move down its concentration gradient. Active transport require ATP it can only occur in the living cell membranes because if cell is not alive, we don't have supply of ATP. And active transport is a movement against concentration gradient. Now, what determines whether or not substance can passively permit a membrane? Um, lipid solubility, so if it's lipid soluble, it can pass through the membrane. Uh, channels of appropriate size or carrier proteins. Um, here's four major types of passive transport. Simple diffusion, carrier mediated facilitated diffusion, channel mediated facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. So we're gonna look first at simple diffusion. Non-polar, lipid-soluble, or hydrophobic, hydrophobic means they repel water, those substances diffuse directly through the phospholipid bilayer. So you can see the diagram that represents simple diffusion. Substances that are lipid-soluble, they move through and no ATP is used. Also, they move from high concentration to low concentration. And this is called down their concentration gradient. Facilitated diffusion. Um, what substances move by a um, uh, process of facilitated diffusion? Glucose, amino acid, and ions. And they, can, they require either carrier protein or channel proteins, or both. Now, all these proteins, carrier proteins and channel proteins, they exhibit specificity or selectivity. That means if we have channel protein for sodium, only sodium can move through this protein, right? So they're specific. They also are saturable. Saturable means well, if we have 100 channel proteins, right, that's it. If they all, if all of them are working, 100 proteins, then we cannot increase the rate of diffusion anymore, right? So saturable means rate is determined by number of carrier or channel proteins. So if we have specific amount of them, um, all of them are working, that's the maximum speed of diffusion. 
we cannot increase the rate of diffusion anymore. And another characteristic of carrier and channel proteins is that they can be regulated, regulated in terms of activity and quantity. So carrier proteins and channel proteins, they're specific, they're uh, saturable, and they can be regulated. So here's the example of facilitated diffusion using carrier proteins. Now remember, because it's still diffusion, we don't need ATP energy, and substances will move down its concentration gradient. Facilitated means we have help of the proteins. So in this example, we have help of carrier proteins. They are transmembrane integral proteins that transport specific polar molecules. For example, sugars, amino acid. Now, when this molecule, let's say this is sugar, when sugar binds to a protein, carrier protein, carrier protein changes its shape and the molecule moves in. So it binds, they open up, and uh, sugar is inside the cell now. But pay attention here, no ATP, and we go from high concentration to low concentration. Now, facilitated diffusion using channel proteins. Um, so channel proteins can be two types. Leakage channels, they always open, or gated channels. And gated channels, they can be open or closed by specific chemicals or maybe some electrical signals. Um, well, some, some channels, uh, gates, gates are controlled by electrical signals. Some of these channels controlled by chemicals. We also have mechanically gated channels as well. And they're also specific. So over here you can see small lipid insoluble solutes that move through the, um, this look like a leakage channel because there is no any gate. So this channel is always open. So they move through the channel down its concentration gradient. Um, for example, water. Water can move by uh, use of the uh, special proteins, they called aquaporins. Water also can move through the lipid bilayer. But when we're talking specifically about movement of water, this passive process is called osmosis. So osmosis is a movement of water, and water is solvent, across a selectively permeable membrane. Some diffuses through plasma membrane, and some using a special aquaporins. Um, now, when we're talking about osmosis, what determines water concentration? Water concentration is determined by solute concentration. More solute, right, less water in the solution. Less solute, more water in the solution, right? Osmolarity is the measure of total concentration of solute particles. And when solutes of different osmolarity are separated by a membrane, osmosis occurs until equilibrium is reached. So here's the first example. And this is example of not osmosis, but diffusion. We have this U-shaped um, flask, or, right, so this, this structure here, and, um, you see, on this arm has low osmolarity. Low osmolarity means we have only few solutes. This arm has higher osmolarity, so we have way more solutes. In this example, it's a sugar molecule. We do have membrane here, but this membrane allows sugar to move through it. 
So when we have this membrane and sugar can move, then sugar molecules obviously gonna move from high concentration to low concentration until concentration in both arms is equal, right? Water will move also back and forth, right? Water and solid, they always are moving. Um, and if membrane allows them to move, soon we will have the same osmolarity and same volume in both arms, right, of this container. So this, this is diffusion, really, because we have sugar that diffused from this right to a left arm. But what's going to happen if we use the membrane that is not permeable to sugar? It's still permeable to water, but not a sugar molecules. Now here we have, in left compartment, we have low osmolarity, higher osmolarity. And if we remove this membrane, we will have this situation, like the previous one, oops, this one. But because we have this membrane, sugar cannot move to the left, then water will move to the right. And th this is a osmosis. So osmosis uh, only happen if we have selectively permeable memory. And it does not allow uh, solutes to move down its concentration gradient. Now we, th we have the same osmolarity over here, but we have different volume, right? So because water freely moves. So osmosis can only happen in the cells, because cells have a selectively permeable membrane, or osmosis can happen actually uh, in a dialysis bag, but dialysis bag uh, is designed to represent the cell membrane. Uh, importance of osmosis. When osmosis occurs, then water enters or leaves a cell, and it causes changes in the cell volume. And when we have change in the cell volume, it can disturb cell functions. And here is tonicity. Tonicity is ability of a solution to cause cell to shrink or swell. So let's go ahead and look at the diagram first. So this diagram represents uh, red blood cells inside plasma. Um, so here, what's shown here in black, Let's imagine this is a blood plasma, and here's erythrocytes surrounding by plasma. Now, when we have isotonic solution, that means that the solute concentration outside and inside of this cell is equal. And then water moves over here in and out, but we don't have net movement of water. Because the same amount of water moves in, the same amount of water moves out, and cells uh, stay their original shape. So there is no change in the uh, size and the shape of a cell in the isotonic solution. Now what's gonna happen if we place the same cell in a hypertonic solution? If this is the hypertonic solution, that means we have high concentration of solute. For example, let's say we have high concentration of salt. So if this we have lots, lots of salt, then water will move out of the cell. So you see the net movement of water is out of the cell. Because water always moves to the area where we have higher concentration of solute. Um, when water is leaving a cell, cell gonna shrink. Right, so that's not good for your red blood cells. If we put the same red blood cells in a hypertonic solution, we have too much water surrounding this cell, hypertonic. Then the net movement of water will be inside the cell and cell will uh, burst or lice because it's accumulates so much water, right? So it's, it's full filled with the water, so it can burst and we call it uh, lysis of a cell. This is called crenation, and this is called lysis. All right, so let's now go back. And uh, if it's isotonic, then a solution with the same solute concentration as of the cytosol of a cell. Hypertonic is a solution 
having greater solute concentration than of the cytosol of a cell and hypotonic is a solution having lesser solute concentration than that of the cytosol of a cell. That's, uh, it's important, uh, it has important application in physiology because if um, patient um, blood plasma is hypertonic or hypotonic to the cytosol of um, blood cells, then cell can be damaged and die. Okay, so here's a summary of passive processes. So we have simple diffusion, we have facilitated diffusion, is a carrier protein mediated or channel protein mediated, and we have osmosis. And you can see here, we still use energy because movement is just not possible to move anything without energy. But this is a kinetic energy, kinetic energy of the particles that are moving. No ATP. And here we have some example. Simple diffusion, for example, oxygen moving through phospholipid bilayer, facilitated diffusion glucose or amino acid, and osmosis is movement of water, either through phospholipid bilayer or through aquaporins. Now active transport. Uh, active transport require ATP and it moves solutes across a living plasma membrane. Two types of active uh, processes, active transport and vesicular transport. So active transport require carrier proteins and then we call them pumps. Uh, it moves solute against the concentration gradient and we have two types of active transport, primary active transport and secondary active transport. Um, so let's look at the picture over here. This picture shows us sodium potassium pump. This is very important uh, protein, carrier protein. It's found in every single cell of your body and it's important in establishing of the Electro, electrochemical gradient across the membrane. So let's look how it works. And this is example of primary transport. So here we have extracellular fluid and here is the cytosol. Now uh, sodium in the cytoplasm binds to the pump, right? Sodium potassium pump. So here's yellow is sodium and um, Green is potassium. So sodium binds to the pump. Now this binding of sodium promotes phosphorylation of the protein by ATP. So now energy of ATP is used. So this phosphate group, the third phosphate group, is transferred from ATP to this protein, right? And of course, ADP is released. Um, now, this phosphorylation causes protein to change its shape, expelling sodium outside, right? So the uh, shape is changed, sodium out. Now, extracellular potassium binds to the pump protein. Now, this causes the release of a phosphate group and carrier protein changing its shape again. So it returns back to its original conformation and potassium in, right? So potassium is released. And now this channel is ready to be binded with sodium again, right? So, um, so now if we go back to um, the whole diagram over here, you can see that um, this pump that establish chemical gradient higher concentration of sodium outside and higher concentration of potassium inside. Um, right, to remember it, just remember that your cells are salty bananas. Like if you have banana and you put salt on your banana, so sodium and chloride will be outside and banana is rich in potassium, so potassium will be inside, right? So, and this is what it says. So sodium potassium pumps located in all plasma membrane membranes involved in the primary and secondary active transport. What I explained you right now was primary transport. 
Um, I will talk about secondary in a second. Um, so it's uh, involved in the primary and secondary transport of nutrients and ions and maintains electrochemical gradient essential for functions of muscle and nerve cells. Right, so here we look at all these uh, diagrams. Right, now what is secondary active transport? Secondary active transport depends on the ion gradient created by primary active transport. Energy stored in ionic gradients is used indirectly to drive transport of other solutes. Um, there is two types of secondary transport, symport and antiport. So let's look at the diagram. Now look, this is sodium potassium pump. This is actually our primary transport because it directly uses energy of ATP. Remember phosphate group is attached, right? This pump changes the shape, sodium out, potassium in. And every single cell has this pump. This is primary transport. Now look over here, what's going on over here? Because this pump creates concentration gradient lots of sodium outside. Now, if you have a channel that allows sodium move in, down its concentration gradient, right? Sodium gonna do it. So you establish concentration gradient by pump, and then sodium moving inside the cell, back inside the cell, because all the substances move down its concentration gradient but sodium is not moving on its own. Sodium actually takes glucose with it. So this is co-transport. So sodium moves because gradient was created and this energy of the chemical gradient now used to carry glucose the, uh, against its concentration gradient. So this is secondary transport because there is no direct ATP use, right? But it's still, if, if this is damaged, then this transport shuts down as well. So sodium and glucose move in one direction. This is called co-transport and specifically symport. Symport, same direction. Um, there is another example when sodium uh, moves in and let's say hydrogen ions moves out. This will be also co-transport, but it will be antiport. So here, what we um, missed over here. Now let's go ahead and read. Co-transport always transport more than one substance at a time. And symport system, two substances transported in same direction. Antiport, two substances transported in opposite direction. Right, so this is secondary active transport because it depends on the chemical gradient created by sodium potassium pump. So it's a co-transport, sodium with glucose, and it's a symport because they move in the same direction. Right, so here we go. Vesicular transport. Vesicular transport is also active process, and it transport of uh, large particles, macromolecules, and fluids across plasma membrane, and require ATP. Here's the major types of vesicular transport: exocytosis out of cell, endocytosis into a cell, transcytosis. Uh, into, across, and out, like across the cell. And substance trafficking is a transport from one area or from one organelle to another area or to another organelle of a cell. So this is within a cell. So this is out, this is in, this is across, and this one within the cell. Now, endocytosis and transcytosis. Uh, involve formation of protein-coated vesicles. Um, so here we have some substances, right? And they will be taken in by these vesicles. This, 
think over here, this is called protein code. Usually a special protein called uh, clethrin. Um, so the vesicle kind of like indentation form, the vesicle form and vesicle with the substances move inside, right? And it can, uh, let's say, uh, fuse with the lysosome and the substances can be digested or it can move across the cell and um, released on the other side, right? This will be this transcytosis and this is endocytosis. And of course, because we already used part of the membrane, right, this vesicle, transport vesicle returns back and fuses with the membrane again. This way we are not losing membrane every time we have endocytosis. So we recycle the plasma membrane. Um, another type of endocytosis is phagocytosis. This is when pseudopods are formed and cell takes in some larger solid particles. Uh, endocytosis, specifically phagocytosis, are uh, process used by macrophages and some other white blood cells. Um, so here you can see phagocytosis when this structure over here and this one, this is called pseudopods. Pseudopods means false feet. And they kind of surrounding this particle and form phagosome. So phagosome then can easily be combined with lysosome and um, whatever inside this phagosome will be digested. Uh, whatever is not digested called residual body and it can be ejected by exocytosis this protein can be, or I'm sorry, this vesicle can be protein coated with the receptors or um, might not be, right? But, um, but phagocytosis is used to bring in uh, solid particles or maybe some bacteria. Uh, now, we, another type of endocytosis is pinocytosis. Pinocytosis is taking in some liquids, some fluids, and whatever is dissolved in those fluids. So this uh, process can be uh, found in a small intestine during nutrient absorption. So here you can see uh, some fluid with um, dissolved particles. Right, those are drops just taken in by the vesicle. There is no any protein, there is no any receptors. So this is very non-specific mechanism. However, this uh, vesicle can be protein coded as well. Um, another type of endocytosis is a receptor mediated endocytosis. Uh, let's look, and we will find it, um, let's say, when your cells take in iron, insulin, or uh, lipoproteins. So here, it's still endocytosis, right? We're taking stuff in, but in this example, we have special receptor proteins, and the molecule need to bind to these receptors for this vesicle to be formed. And this is our um, protein code over here, right? So molecule uh, binds, molecules that binds to the receptor is called ligand. So ligand binds and those ligands are taken in and then receptors are recycled, right? Okay, so let's kind of uh, go back and see what we cover so far. So we said that uh, another type of transport is vesicular transport, and vesicular transport is active process, so it's require ATP, but um, the substances are taken in or taken out inside vesicles. That's why it's specific type. And we can have exocytosis, endocytosis, transcytosis, or trafficking. And we talk about endocytosis, and we said, well, we can have, um, so endocytosis or transcytosis, here either we take it in or we um, 
move it across the cell, then it will be transcytosis. Now, endocytosis, it can be phagocytosis, right? So here's our phagocytosis. Then we have formation of pseudopods. It can be pinocytosis. That's a fluid. So it's kind of cell is drinking, and this one cell is eating. So this is specific. This is less specific. Or it can be receptor-mediated endocytosis. This one is very specific because only certain molecule that binds to the receptor can be taken in. So it goes in and receptors are recycled back and incorporated inside the membrane, right? So again, um, uh, phagocytosis, phenocytosis, receptor-mediated endocytosis, they are part of endocytosis or transcytosis. Um, exocytosis. Example of exocytosis uh, would be hormone secretion, neurotransmitter release, mucus secretion, and ejection of waste. Now, substances are moved out of a cell also inside vesicles. Right, so here's the process of exocytosis. We have a vesicle, and inside there is some molecule. It might be neurotransmitter, right? It might be some hormone. But this vesicle moves towards the membrane. Then there is some proteins that attaches this vesicle to the membrane. And the plasma membrane of the vesicle fuses with cell membrane. Right, they fuse together, uh, forming this opening, a pore, and whatever was inside the vesicle now can be released to the cell exterior. So this is exocytosis. Um, and here we have a summary of the active process. Okay, where's my pointer? So processes, primary active transport uses ATP, and here, example, are our pumps, right? We have sodium pump, we have uh, sodium potassium pump. Um, we have secondary active transport that use energy of iron gradient that was created by primary active transport. And this is used for movement of polar or charged solutes across membrane. We have co-transport, symport, antiport, we have exocytosis out, right, inside the vesicles using ATP, secretion of hormones and neurotransmitters, phagocytosis, phenocytosis, receptor-mediated endocytosis. These three processes are example of endocytosis or transcytosis. All of them use ATP. And phagocytosis, example, white blood cells, phagocytosis of well, the phagocyte uh, bacteria or viruses, phenocytosis, that's a um, fluids absorption by intestinal cells, receptor-mediated endocytosis, um, hormones or cholesterol uptake. Okay, this was the last slide um, in this video lecture. And this video lecture was about cell transport. Thank you for watching and I hope it was helpful.